Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, this is really, really exciting to me because um, I first started coming to Louisiana as a Terpsichorean tourist to dance. When I first heard Zydeco, when I lived in D.C., there was a uh, Conjunto and Zydeco accordion concert at Wolf Trap. I was hooked on, on Zydeco. And so um, a lot's changed over the years and I'm really thrilled to see all the work that's been done and I, I hope to keep helping any way I can. Um, so, okay, well a lot of this, I'm just gonna zip through really quick because we've really covered a lot. Um, that this, I, I did sort of a literature search to begin with. I had no idea, like, as far as the vernacular architecture and the culture intangible, how do you how do you understand these places and how do you how do you understand how these buildings came to be where they are and their form and their, their function. So um, these are basically what we talked about the context and um, the, the primary function and purpose of a dance hall is for dancing. So that's real clear, and I think the dance floor should be the most character-defining feature of the building. And, and look at the building the inside out and how people use the building. Um, it's set in uh, this, this area here. Um, I looked at for uh, uh, Acadiana, I think, I don't know enough about. I know I came here during the tourist era, and um, uh, this, uh, as we all know, was Spanish and French and Native American before that, and um, it's, it's a landscape that's been utilized over the generations for farming and agricultural, and also the special soils uh, here that, um, allowed the industries. I, I think all these are important in the, in the culture, so I don't know if that fits with a National Register nomination or not, but um, I'm always kind of outside the box in what I'm doing anyway. So, um, And then again, this just reinforces these, the places that I looked at are the, um, in the, the prairie. And what I, the, the, the farms, the, the ranches, um, and then uh, historically, the architecture goes way back, as um, we all know. But uh, I just wanted to point out a, a couple examples of the architecture and similarities. Um, we have all the way up in Cane River, um, uh, Creole culture, Creole communities. And there's been uh, Creole colonies. There are a lot of research done. Uh, up there, and I'm not sure as how much research has been done in this area on the Creoles and, and the history in, in the prairie lands down here. Um, and and the, the house dance, the house floor plan, um, if you see, notice kind of the galleries on the sides, and then the, I don't know if this points or not, but the walls where you walk through the doors and it, the shape of, of the... So, um, and what's really important in a dance hall is the dancing and the dance. And, and this is an older dance that you'll see throughout the, the uh, Creole world, I think. I mean, I've, uh, I've encountered it and reading about it in, in the French Caribbean and, and we still do it up in Atlanta and it's all over this contra dance which is in lines. And I'm just, just to imagine um, that line out on a gallery. I, I'm not a dance expert. There are dance experts out there, and that's why I'm kind of asking about bringing in interdisciplinary research to talk to um, these buildings and the forms and how they, how they were used over time. Um, so I looked at places that people dance and um, uh, this, obviously, this was already mentioned, the plantation stores, um, the commercial part goes back even further than the 20th century, so maybe 
I don't know how this can be divided up, so I'm just throwing all the stuff out here. <laughs> um, and this was an, and a juke joint again. Um, and and the, the places that I looked at are not juke joints and, and um, not ill repute. Uh, so um, I just put that there as an example. And then church dances we already mentioned. Um, and some uh, people that study African American uh, music and history talk a lot about the real importance of the sacred and the secular and the juke joint on Saturday night and church on Sunday. And, and um, but all the music is all obviously all tied together. And um, so, oh yes, and that was a, an important point. This in between uh, space for the community. I mean, I see. Especially Creole, you know, in our country we have this heritage of, you know, segregation of black and white, and and I see Creole is is emerging, and that's it's, it's betwixt in between culturally and betwixt in between and in locations in the sites with the preservation of some of these, but um, this is the outside of the building. Again, the inside is very important. Um, this was up in, uh, when I was up in, uh, up in the north, up near Chopin, uh, uh, up in there, I forget the name, Clutcherville. Um, wait, am I going the wrong way? Did I have it twice? No, yeah, I'm going the wrong way again. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> and then, um, um, again, the house dance we mentioned. So we got all different kinds of houses and house dances over time. And, um, just to mention that the, the diaspora of this culture, you know, thinking about the blues trail and how the, it's mapped beyond where it begins um, up in uh, Maryland where I started dancing this. People had house dances and they'd move the furniture out of the rooms and, and dance. So um, it goes on. And then, of course, Opelousas and the birth of Chenier, uh, Clifton Chenier, and, and I think, um, uh, yeah, it's, there's a, a lot of good history being done up there and promotion of the, the home of Zydeco. But, and so in the Louisiana Creole, the values, again, these are have already been mentioned pretty much. Uh, there's a, a Creole poet, Sybil Kine, who wrote about, you know, every every time there's always uh, celebrations, there's always food and music and dancing. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, sort of shows, the re this is the relationship between the dance hall and the house. Um, uh, Hamilton, this is at Hamilton's Club, and there was a bouchery one so Sunday morning when I stopped by um, to, to look at the club, and, and Mr. William Hamilton gave me a tour that was um, really nice. They were getting ready for a family celebration. And um, so again, I think what's really, really important is the continuity of the culture and yet the change over time. And so um, the agricultural landscape, the, you know, everybody's driving trucks and wearing boots and, and you know, hauling stuff and um, the site plan next to the owner's home, close to the road, uh, residential scale, and again, the cultural expression, and, and a lot of this is, it's a family business, it's a farm is a business, and a dance hall is a business. So there's continuity there. Um, so this is, a, a few of us came out to Richard's, um, way out in the, pretty much in the country out there in Lotel, um, near uh, the Offshore Lounge, which, by the way, they have really changed that place. We had a fundraiser in Atlanta, we didn't raise a whole lot, but the Cajun and Zydeco Association, but they've, with the building codes and everything, it looks like they've done a lot, and that's um, good to see. But back to Richard's, um, the, uh, here's what it looked like when I was there back in 2003, these overgrown bushes, and um, it, the whole building wasn't pink at the time. It had the, you know, the red barn paint, and, um, and this is uh, one of the, the sisters' house next door when we were just here the other day. It was just all overgrown. It looks like it's abandoned. And then here is, this was Kerman Richard's house. I was told I'd talk to Anne Richard, who was 
running the dance uh, one of the times I talked to her when I was there. And um, um, then his brother, our cousin Teddy, uh, built the disco, uh, Teddy's Lounge later. Uh, but Richard's dates back to the 1940s. We've mentioned that before. And um, now owned by Cravens, I believe. And uh, so here's a site plan of um, the buildings and the location um, near the railroad tracks out past the town, but yet it's within the family compound. Um, so and though the other day there was a mention that, that um, someone else owned the brick house and Teddy's now. So this kind of is confusing with what I thought I knew. But so do hopefully documentation and tax records and whatever, if you all have that down here, tax maps and can help sort out ownership and, and uh, improvements to the property. You can see when the, uh, an improvement, a building is added onto a property. Um, so uh, just some of the features, the, the entrance on the, on the picture on the left is where they bring in the, the beer and, and deliveries and a sign out front uh, announcing the dance. Um, and the, just some of the details, the back now, since they upgraded it, there's a, there's a ramp on the back um, to bring the band equipment in. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Um, okay, and here's the floor plan, again, uh, with the like gallery-like space around the sides where everyone sits now, and then the dance hall's in the middle. But I just think the structural, um, the structure is quite interesting to me. It may just be a function of building span, or it may be uh, anthropologists talk about the embodied, the folklore, material culture study, to talk about the embodied memory in the builders and what they're building, the vernacular construction they learn through the generations. They they learn how to build things, and is there you know a connection here? I don't know, or is it? something to do. I did start looking at agricultural uh, vernacular architecture, but um, didn't have a time to pursue all that. And there may be some other, maybe it's similar to a barn. I don't know. I haven't done that analysis, but I'd like to either get to that myself. We'll see. I hope I'm not running out of time. Um, and then, I, let's see, did I skip something? Yeah, and then just to throw in the contrast with the, the urban uh, place, I just kind of zip over this because um, um, I don't want to run out of time. How much time do I have left? But, hmm? Oh, good, good. I'm doing better. But I brought my clock to watch. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how much of you know El Cido's, but um, he's another businessman and a very excellent promoter of um, his businesses. And um, he built uh, El Cido's. And uh, it's, as people mentioned the other day about having the local uh, family-oriented Mother's Day dinners, um, it's in a community. It's in a suburb. It's in North Lafayette, which is uh, primarily um, sort of older buildings, and uh, I haven't studied it in depth, but it looks very kind of economically disadvantaged or underrepresented um, in uh, major studies. I mean, I, I couldn't find anything when I was looking for uh, documentation uh, besides, I mean, King of Zydeco, the musicians, people talk about clubs, but a real um, rigorous uh, analysis for real um, in-depth, I'm just, I just have that kind of brain. I always want to know more, 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 so. Um, but it was great. He, he took me to the one-stop shop. He, he showed, he told me how that helps pay for his club when times get tough, and, and this is his house that he built. Um, which is just gorgeous. I just love this picture. I just love it. He's such a cool guy. Um, and so the uh, here's where it's located in Lafayette. So it's in the urban area. And now we'll jump in another side of Lafayette, away on the south side of Lafayette, which I find really interesting. And there's still more I want to know about how Mr. Adam Hamilton, a sharecropper, managed to buy 100 acres of land. 
and um, build his home. And the home, uh, let's see in this picture, the, there's um, the, the, the home, let's see, they look kind of alike in these little pictures. One was built by Adam Hamilton, the father that bought the land, and they expanded the house and they had a lot of kids. I brought my notes here, but um, this may go into a nomination or something. I'll tell the whole story. But, um, and the barn is out back. The animals are still there. I was there um, on October 19, 2008. And um, the, the trucks, the, they were feeding the, the pigs. Uh, as I said, they're having a luxury. I just went by here when I drove into town Sunday, and um, uh, everybody's still there. Mr. William Hamilton, unfortunately, passed away five years ago, but his brother, Adam, who must be Adam Jr., um, still lives in one of the houses. There's like three brick houses. The, there's one to the, when you're looking at Hamilton's, one to the right and two to the left. Um, so we all know iconic Hamilton's club. Um, and this is just the interior of the day I was there. Um, again, they were decorating for, I forget if it was a birthday party or a, so this place started, um, he told me that um, his cousin started it and they used to have ball games and people would come in the trucks to the baseball games they had out in the field out back. And um, it was smaller and then later, in the 80s, I think it was, they expanded it into the dance hall. And again, that's kind of the, the, the time, the era, the changing over time of these, these places. And we've seen that, um, but I didn't. But off to the left, the bar is in, in the back. Um, and they had sheets over the liquor uh, in the bar. And he told me because they were going to be having kids there, they covered up the booths. So, and also when it was a baseball, it was more of a private community place out in the farmland. I, I want to look at maps of Lafayette back at that time and see how far, what, what was the landscape like. Again, the landscape to me is so important in the setting. And, um, but he said that one half of it was for the teenagers and the other half was for the adults at one point. Um, so here's a map, kind of a partial map. I realize this needs to be developed. All of this needs to be developed. But um, Hamilton's in the middle there with the family homes on the side and the fence and the barns and the animals like that. So this is Philip Gould. I'm so excited he's going to be here later. I want to see more of his pictures of the dance halls. And, um, and uh, so again, back to... Richard's Club. This is what it looks like pretty much now when we're there. Um, this was um, a few years ago, and uh, you can see the changes. And so, and this raises the question that is really uh, raised by Gibbs Place also. Um, this hasn't changed as drastically, but when places change over time and they're part of a living culture, and then they become memorialized or museumized or um, you know, that's uh, to be aware of how we move forward with preserving these places and um, maybe prioritizing some. Some maybe uh, need to be uh, sort of a community focus and maintain as a community center and people like us all come together and help identify which ones really need to continue in their current use, even if it's monthly or whatever. Set up the reserve funds to try to set up a foundation and try to try to keep them in the current use. And then maybe others, you can't save everything. This is what we do where I work. It's really, I, I, I can't participate in it though. It's too painful. And like what Gail does with FEMA is very painful, where you have to give up on your dream and your vision and face reality. But I, I just, I can't give up. So that's my little voice, is to keep saying that um, we have to maintain the, the use and the integrity of the space, not just the fabric, but the use and the, the, the number of people in a hall. That goes back to, gosh, this point I left out my, I think we're seeing a different slideshow than I really intended. <laughs> I come to think of it. I had some pictures.
pictures in here of dances and the history of dance. And, um, oh my gosh, I went out for to supervise over there. Which one? Um, I've got unloaded. Um, so dancing, the contra dance, we started with the contra dance, and then, um, let me remember now, going up through that, that was like early, like late 1700s, comes from Europe, and then during the 19th century, you get waltzes, which was scandalous, because people, instead of just passing by each other and doing these little minuet turn curtsy things, they were actually touching each other when they danced, and it was a scandalous change, but thank God for waltzes, because they're so much fun. And then, um, gosh, oh gosh, I love that it's not on here. Let me remember now. And then we get to the 20th century, I'm really leaping ahead, because there's a whole history of dance, and there are people that study dance, and, and uh, so I think it'd be really fun to relate uh, again, how the dances relate to the building. So in the 20th century, you get into the, the ragtime and the Charleston and the, uh, a lot of uh, even more scandalous dancing. And, and here's another side of the dance hall history. When we get into the urban dance halls, um, the, they've been written on a lot up in the north about um, the laws in Chicago against dance halls and, and the ill repute and just the stuff that goes on in dance halls. and. So that's a whole other element of dance hall history. I mean, Creole Dance Hall is one little piece here in the Louisiana Dance Hall, and then even the Gulf Coast Dance Halls we can look at. So, um, and again, these are the, the similar uh, spaces that have been talked about. So, okay, and then we get into the 20th century and the Swamp Pomp era, which is the uh, swing dancing, and swing dance has changed over time. And, and one of my theories about the dancing and the changing in the dances, it has to do with the amount of space that you have to dance in. And Zydeco typically, uh, when I learned it back in the 90s, the dances change with time. The names of dances change. You can have uh, uh, West Coast Swing, East Coast Swing, DC Hand Dancing, St. Louis Imperial Swing, uh, eight count swing, six count swing. I mean, there's all these kinds of dances that, that are done here. But um, if you have a small place to dance, your dance is going to be different than a big place. And, and so that's important too. And like, that'd be an exciting study, like juke joint dancing versus, uh, you know, lounge dancing versus bar dancing versus, I mean, the dance halls. And the dance hall, again, is a place of, these one, there's Creole dance halls at least that I've looked at. I shouldn't overgeneralize, but um, um, it, again, it's a place between. It's not the bar. It's not the lounge. It's definitely not the juke joint. It's it's a family. It's it's overseen. It's controlled environment for um, for the community and the, maybe the older folks. Maybe it's the old and the young. So that might be part of it. So there's the da the dance floor. Okay, quickly, architectural stuff. Um, again, the upgrades and the pipes, they try to make it uh, accessible railing there, I think is what that is an attempt. They did, you can see the change. We talked about the windows and the air conditioning um, and how that's been changed and uh, inside of the dance, uh, what it's like and just the continuity of the culture and hopefully someone in Sid's family will take over Alcido's, someone in Hamilton's family will take over Hamilton's and, and I just uh, also want to say, you know, that the, the being a dancer and one of the things I know a lot of people that don't dance, they have this fear, you feel like, oh my God, no, don't ask me to dance, I'm not going to dance, I don't know how to dance, I'm the opposite, it's like, how can I find someone to dance with? And I just want to say these, these dance halls that right now we see, we see on the landscape and they're just out there and they're just mute and they're just standing waiting for someone to ask them to dance. 